So we're on. So hey, guys, thank you so much. We're on the Espresso Mastery session, and we've got a great guest today. Uh, we have Jordan and Hoskins, and she's here, and she's going to talk to us about her business. And just want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, uh, put, it in, put it inside the chat area. And um, so, Jordan, tell us a little bit about, uh, first of all, you started out in Denver. You ended up here uh, in, the, in this area here. So how did you get into real estate? How, that, how did it all start for you? Um, well, I started at a really small mom and pop firm doing open houses. Um, cause they were mainly new construction agents. They right. were builders, developers. Um, so I did open houses for them and ended up closing two clients in my first two months of being licensed. And I fell in love, um, just with everything, you know, being a part of people's stories, being able to be able to just be there for them. Um, and the way that I wish that my agent had been there for me when I bought my house, um, so that's kind of how I got it all started. Then you married this guy who dragged you all over the world. And so um, when I, you know, I really want to talk about how you juggle this life of the military wife and the kids and all this. So how did you kind of transition and move into this other market? Um, so I was lucky enough that I got licensed here in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and that's where Zach has been stationed and was stationed um, through his the rest of his military career. So we haven't had to move around with my license, thank goodness. Um, so we, I've been able to become very established here, um, but it was definitely interesting uh, moving around and I watch all of my military spouse, friends who are realtors move around the country and get associated with new contracts. And I was asking, I was like, what's different? What's different? And every place is just always a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting too, because for those of you that are military, as you're watching this and or dealing with military families, I mean, it's uh, you're this is a different life, man. You're 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 going or you're staying and you're meeting new people. So tell you know, let's talk a little bit about how you start up your business because you're averaging, you know, this you're above average. I mean, when the average agent is doing four to six, you're doing twenty to thirty averaging per year, which is like which is great, um, you know, which is that that sweet spot, right? and still juggling a family. How did you get this thing working for you in, in this area? I had to really get out of my comfort zone. Um, I'm definitely more of a like small circle. I've got a couple really good friends and that, that's it. Um, naturally shy. And I just had to get out there. I had to start posting more on social media. I had to do some Facebook lives. I had to make calls, um, you know, get lists from people like the amazing Bill Crespo. Um, and just make those calls, talk to people and really learn how to communicate, not just real estate because real estate is a whole different language. So you got to learn how to talk that, but also just learn how to talk to people about people and using that as a main reference and just talking to people, even in the grocery store, wearing my name tag, wearing anything that resembles anything real estate while I'm out and about. It gets you're talking. shy. You're the shy person that had to come out of their... I mean, how do you go through that? Because it's a lot of people that are in real estate that want to step it up. It is, you know, when we do our Monday morning launch and we're doing, uh, you know, talking about physicals and expires and people go, well, I haven't started yet. You got to start. You got to get things going. How did you get yourself in that out of the shy mode and just get out there and start meeting people? I mean, what what clicked? Well, I had to I had to create a competition for myself because. I was never a team sports person. So comparing myself to other people was never a motivator for me. Cause I was right. always like, eh, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Um, so then I had to like kind of dig in. Okay. I like individual sports. I like beating my own records. I like beating my own best or whatever. So right. I had to get into that competition mindset for myself um, where, okay. I made this many calls today. Let me make this many calls tomorrow. Can I do more than that? Can I set more appointments than I did last week, this week by changing up this script? Okay, I learned how to handle this objection. Let me learn how to handle five more objections so I can be better prepared next time. And just really being my own critic and my own source of- Did you track yourself? I mean, how did you know how much, you know, did you kind of really were looking at each week and dissecting it? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would look and I would say, okay, I've made this many calls. I've set this many appointments. 
what does that ratio turn down to? Okay, let's, how can we ramp that up? Let me try using this and then see how that ramps up um, and just really keeping track of everything. So you must have had a big goal. I mean, you to, to go over the reach because, you know, hey, we forget about rejection happens in these situations, right? So you must <laughs> like, hey, I'm going after it. Yeah, um, it was just a matter of I quit my, my job and this was my full-time job and I had bills to pay. So I needed to go out there and I just needed to do it. Do you, uh, let me ask you this question. This is a controversial question. Can you really do this part-time? Nowadays, I mean, maybe years ago. I mean, what do you think? Is this a can you actually create a part time business in real estate in this day and age? It depends on your personality, it depends on what you are really willing to do and the hours that you're willing to put in. If you can work a 40 hour job and then still work 60 to 80 hours on your real estate stuff, because that's really what it takes. You have to, if you're going to be successful, if you're going to be a full, you know, this it's a it's your goal to get to full-time status. You have to put in 60, 80 hours a week. To Wait a minute, there. 60 plus, let's do the math here. 40 plus 60 is a hundred hours divided by how many days you want to work? This is at least six. So let's say six. So that's 17 hours a day working a full-time job. I would think it's a little bit nutty, but I mean, I'm sure some people want to do that. So yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying is you got to be completely lasered in on both situations. Yeah, you really do. Um, especially when you're first starting out, um, as you get more established, you know, those hours can cut back or become more depending on the season and where you're at in your pipeline. Um, but really, especially when you're starting out, you've got to build that pipeline and building that pipeline is what takes all of the hard, long hours of rejection after rejection, just to get that one person who's like, Oh, maybe I'll give you a try. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, how did you face those, uh, the rejection aspect of it? Cause that's always a challenge for people. They, they actually rejected me. You either go into your hut, your little hole, or you continue to get through. How do you get through that rejection phase for you personally? So for me personally, I had to really look at, okay, what did I, I use it as a learning opportunity. Of course, you know, the little shy, girl and me was like, oh, they didn't like me. Ah. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you if you're going to be successful, you have to kind of get a harder outer shell. Um, you got to grow some thick skin sometimes and use it as a learning opportunity. Okay, what didn't they like? And I'm, I'm not afraid to ask people, you know, when they're like, hey, Jordan, we decided to go with somebody else. Okay, hey, what could I have done better? What could I have, you know, done differently? Is there anything that you were looking for specifically that I did not address? Did you, what was it? And use that as a learning opportunity. People will be honest with you. Um, and someone was like, I don't want to hear the proof of stuff. Don't tell me I'm great. And you just chose somebody else. Yeah. Tell me. Yeah. Yeah. What did, so what did you learn? So when you get rejected, let's say you've, there's a couple of things that really took the, that you helped you to take that turn into getting that consistency that you wanted. What was the couple of things that you learned about yourself that you had to change? Biggest thing is getting out there um, and not being so shy, not being in my own bubble yeah. is one of the biggest things that I had to learn and change about myself. Um, the other thing is what we just talked about. You know, I used to take, I was very hard on myself with criticism from other people. And I've just kind of had to learn to take it at what it is. If it's criticism, then it's criticism. If it's constructive, then use that and help grow myself. Great, great. And then you have now with a family, you got your little three-year-old out there running around. So how do you juggle momhood and real estatehood all, all at the same time? She's my little assistant a lot of times, um, especially when she was just an itty bitty baby. Um, I mean, she was two weeks old and coming with me to a final walkthrough. It, just, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, most people I find, they want you to be a real person. Like, Yes, they appreciate that you're a professional and yes, you can put on your professional jacket and, you know, talk all this real estate stuff. But at the end of the day, they, they appreciate that you are a real person yeah. and with a real life and a real family. And so she comes with me a lot of times if I don't have, she's in school a lot of time um, during the week, but on weekends, like, all right, you want to see this house? My kid's coming with me. Like, great, bring her along. I can't even tell I you like how many that. times my daughter has made <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. You know, I think people want to know that you're a real person. I mean, you know, we're not. This is a people business. I remember years ago, you know, because I had six of them. That um, I'm in the car. So when they were a little bit older, I mean, right now I'd probably be arrested to do what I did when they're when the kids were little. But uh, I sometimes I had to keep them. You know, it was a nice day. It wasn't hot. Left them in the car. Did my listening presentation. Um, so you got to do what you got to do. But they they know that your mom just like they are. Yeah. If in that case, but they respect you. And, and then, so you took them out to, to the appointments. What was your schedule like? I mean, how did you run this schedule throughout the week? Do you have a set schedule that you're running right now? So my set schedule is I wake up in the morning and immediately make sure that all my emails are caught up on. I cannot have more than 30 emails in my inbox. It drives me bonkers. So anything that comes in overnight, um, is immediately sorted out to where it needs to go. And if right. there's anything pressing, um, like this morning I had a walkthrough and there's all sorts of things going on with it. So I had to get that all sorted out before my daughter got up in the morning. Luckily, I'm a very lucky mom, very rare child who sleeps in until eight o'clock in the morning. Love it, love it. <laughs> Didn't have that, but you're lucky to have that. So I get all of that done before she wakes up. And then the hours between eight and 9 a.m., that's, that's her hour before she goes off to school, um, where I really try and just focus on her. And then from nine until four or 4.30 when I pick her up, sometimes a little bit later, I'm just, I'm working, um, whatever it depends on that day. So I try to, as much as I can, time block what's gonna be most important that day. So today, the most important thing was walkthrough and closing. Tomorrow, my most important things are going to be, you know, making my calls, making my Facebook posts, scheduling everything out, um, and just, you know, day by day, what's going to be the most important thing. How day. often are you prospecting now? Would give me your, what's the game plan on the prospecting side? What do you mean by that? <laughs> like, no, days a week? Well, here's a good one. How often are you doing it to maintain the business that you have going on throughout the year? Because you've, you know, they don't just fall in your lap. Right. You're going to have to go out right. and get some. So how often are you going out and getting, how often are you fishing to find those leads? Well, if you take, you know, just even wearing your name badge everywhere, then that's seven days a week because right. wearing your name badge and going out and talking to people when you're out running errands, that's seven days a week. Um, if you're talking about, you know, making the calls, um, following up with past clients to ask for referrals, stuff like that, you know, that's at least still at least one to three times a week. Um, one time a week when things are just insane and you can't get anything else done, but it's still once a week um, that you're that I'm making those calls, uh, following up with people, whatever they need to do. Right, right. You know, I talked to um, someone this past week and he says, man, you know, I just realized if I just open my mouth more, I'm going to get business. You know, we got Fizbo's, we got expireds, we've got our center of influence, we've got all these people that we have to talk to just to let them know we're still in the business. What seems to be your be your best source for, you know, continue to keep your 20 to 30 deals a year up? What's your best source? Honestly, a lot of it is Facebook, social media interaction. Um, as weird as it sounds, and I tell, you know, listing clients all the time, like, I'm going to put your house on social media because social media sells homes. It's weird. But social media also gets you clients, which is, again, weird. But it's the best way to stay top of mind. Um, you know, people in my generation, people who are, we're on social media all the time. I have to set a timer for myself to make sure that I don't get on social media for too long. Right. Um, and I know several other people who are in the same, same boat. So if I'm constantly posting and constantly, you know, being a part of that algorithm, that's what really helps. Yeah. And so um, when you're looking at the business today and as you're continuing, because you're, do you do a lot with the military right now? Are you getting a lot of leads from the military market? Um, I do get a lot of military leads um, from my husband's service, whether they're part of his ship, whether they're past clients um, who are part of the same command, um, you know, people switching in and out of command. Well, there, I've got also friends around the world who are like, oh, you're going to Norfolk, call Jordan. And then I've got people going to Guam and I'm like, oh, call this person, you know, so kind of vice versa. Yeah. I love that. And okay, so let's talk about people that are like in your situation that are struggling, that are not really doing the things that they need to be doing. And they just say, I wish I could just get 20 or 30 deals consistently. Because I really believe that if you're in the business, in this business of real estate, in my opinion, 
Uh, you should be doing at least two transactions a month to just kind of be in it, stay alive, find out what's going on with the marketplace, to be able to understand what things go wrong in contracts. So you've got someone that's on the other end listening to you and go, gosh, I wish I could be a Jordan, which would be scary, right? No, I'm just kidding. It's a little scary. <laughs> yeah. oh, gosh, not a Jordan. So what, what would you recommend for these people that are out there struggling? Because you've been able to in a very short account, you started in the business in what, 14, 2014? Yep. So you've been in, when did things start to really be consistent for you? Within the first, I would say it took about six months to really get that pipeline going. Um, and then since then, it's been pretty consistent. It lagged off a little bit um, with pregnancy and maternity leave and stuff like that. But then another six months after that, it became consistent again. So what would you recommend? So if someone's trying to get this business back and running and they may be like you a little bit uh, shy or maybe I, you know, maybe they just don't know what to do next. How fast can they get up and running and what could, what would you recommend? I mean, it's really up to you how fast you get up and running. Um, and that's a beautiful thing about this business is if you go out there and you, you hit the pavement hard, you do door knockers, you do pop buys, you do, you know, you're getting out there, you're getting involved in your community, different community events, which I know is hard right now um, with all the COVID stuff yeah, yeah. going on. So it's harder to get out there, but there's still ways to do that. There's still ways to be creative. Um, and I would say within three months, you can have a good pipeline being built where you're getting the, con the consistency going that you really need to. You just can't um, be shy. You can't, you cannot be shy in this business. No, it's a people okay. business. You have yeah. to really... So, and I see some, you know, I, I'm really the, if you're analytical, you tend to want to be analytical about it. And if you're amiable, you want to be shy about it. What for sure did you find out did not work? Something you did that did not work and you go, let's not go there because that thing didn't get me anywhere. What did not work for you? I advertised in a golf magazine. <laughs> you know. I, I paid a lot of money for a print marketing golf magazine where I was going to be the exclusive agent for, you know, all of these golf clubs. Someone sold you something there, Jordan. <laughs> Somebody definitely sold me something. That was in my purse. Yeah, I could be the golf agent. Um, so, so you spent money on that. Yep. I'm afraid to ask how much it is because it would just drive me nuts probably. But, <laughs> but, but that didn't, how fast did you find out that didn't work? I mean, like soon you did it, how much later did you find it didn't work? within a month, I was like, I probably should not have done that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think because of this industry, we get sold a lot of different situations. Obviously, the, the cheapest thing is picking up that phone and making conversations with people, right? Whether it be FISBOs, expireds, getting, getting those leads and working it and, and just using all the sources. So when you think about the sources for you, um, what seems to be the one that you avoid the most? What you, like the sources of yeah, like leads. find leads, which one do you kind of, you know, I don't want to work that one or do you work them all? I would say expires are one because in our market, what a lot of people will do is I know a lot of agents do this and I don't know about other markets um, across the, the country, but in our market, people will take it down, you know, withdraw it, say it expired, only list it for two months, whatever, and then relist it you know, within a week or two after they do some repairs or whatever. Um, so again, this might just be my own personal holdup, but I don't want to step on another agent's toes if that's going to be already be their client. Right. Um, I, and, and let me just say, I have no problem stepping on other agent's toes um, because depending on your goals and what you want to do, um, you know, they got really slick here years ago by, um, you know, turning that, taking it off the market and making it into withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you have a better, I mean, Jordan, I mean, you are better than the average agent. And if that listing was with that average agent, then, you know, hey, more power to you, go after it. Yeah. So, so when you think about what you've got to do more of, knowing that we're coming 2021, um, you know, this whole thing with the COVID is gone. There's a demand for real estate. Their interest rates are low. You know, what do you see as the opportunity for you in 2021 that, that maybe wasn't there earlier? I think a huge opportunity is FISBO. 
because there's so yeah. I've done more physical transactions on the buyer side where my buyers are buying for sale by owners or off market properties more this year than I have any other year combined combined. Um, so I think going out there and just finding the listings, you know, talking to people who maybe aren't owner occupants, you know, really targeting those people and the people who are for sale by owner and really showing the value that, Hey, look, yeah, it's a seller's market, but just because it's a seller's market doesn't mean that you can't get taken advantage of. And I'm here to prevent that. I'm here to get you top dollar because statistics show that you get more when you list with an agent, even though it does cost you, it costs you some, but you still end up netting more. I'm um, yeah. just able to show them those numbers. And I think that opportunity is out there more than it's ever been before. Yeah, I think that's huge. Uh, the first, the, first of all, think about it. You've got a person that's for sale by owning their, their house. Um, they're saying, I want to sell. To me, that is, I mean, what better lead can you find than the person saying, I want to sell. I just happen not to find the right agent to list with. I'm going to do it myself. And that's really what's happening right now is that um, the day that that person told me years ago when I was hitting for sale by owners, I said, you know, the only reason why I'm for sale by owners is because I'm looking for a good agent. I went, interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. I said, there's an opportunity here. But you said a couple other things here. Is that what you said also is that we got to dig deeper. We got to go into these other areas, FISBOs and um, absentee owners, all these places, because you know the listing inventory is still low in some markets, but you've got opportunities here in, in different markets to go after these absentee owners and the FISBO. So have you done much with these other areas and try to pull listings that were not obvious? Have you tried those? So not yet. I'm still working on um, building my base um, through a couple of, you know, mailer systems and stuff like that to, to build that up. Um, because honestly, it's just something that came to me within the last month where I was like, I've done, you know, X amount of off market properties this year. Why am I not tapping into this? And just started, you know, started trying to build it and like, okay, well, what, what ideas can I do? What ideas can I, you know, put out there? What flyers can I mail out to them? You know, stuff like that. Um, wait, someone says something here. Uh, are you social on social or asking for business? Okay. So, so who's that? Reetha says, are you social or are you asking for business on social media? What's going on there? What are you doing there? Both. <laughs> um, okay. It's a good way to stay top of mind. There's, there's ways to ask for business without asking for business. Um, one of the best ways, I don't know, I was actually just talking to, because I mentor a lot of the new agents in our office, still, as you know. Um, so I was talking to one of our newer agents today, and she's like, oh, I don't want to go to all these events because I'm not doing any business right now. So I don't need to network with other realtors. I just need to, you know, buckle down and, and do this. And I said, well, yes, but look at all of the stuff that was posted on social media from the events that you missed this week. And what better opportunity to say, hey, look at this great fun thing I'm doing. I'm at a photo shoot because I'm a realtor. Hey, look at this great networking event that I'm at because I'm a realtor. There's ways to ask ah. a business without and stay top of mind as a realtor without saying, hey, you need to buy yourself a house. You know anybody who wants to buy yourself a house? Buy yourself. So that's a good point. So you're letting people know that you're at these events and I guess subliminally people go, yeah, Hey, she's very active in, she's very active in real estate. She's mm -hmm. doing the things that keeps her moving in real estate. And uh, so that's a very, very, very good way without, you know, I, I'm not excited for me personally to see someone jumping on a table drinking and saying, I'm in an event. That's actually not what we're saying. We're saying, Hey, just be as professional as you can, because there are some realtors that are posting some crazy stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, you got to be careful, um, you know, especially if you are using social media as a way for business um, and you're putting business stuff on there as well. You want to try and stay neutral um, with, you know, not drinking, party, heavy, no. crazy, stripping, whatever, no. um, whatever your thing is, you know, don't don't put that on the one where you're also putting business stuff. Um and then also, you know, political stuff. I see a lot of that uh, recently. Just keep everything neutral. Neutral. Yeah, and I see that happening a lot too. And what's interesting too is that 
what you're doing here to it actually helps you with the fizzbos expires and all these other people because they uh, someone may think about putting their house on the market someone may be on the market right now as a for sale by owner what you do is putting out this brand this this image of yourself and what you're saying is hey i'm an active person in real estate i'm out there they see you you're professional two and two make sense to them and they're going after people and you we play the odds there's more people not being that way in real estate to, unfortunately um not really getting out there as much and, and you know you're seeing yourself getting out there which is really good and i hope that answered uh the question for you so let's talk about i wrote a couple of things that i wanted to ask you is as you're coming into the marketplace that has been here before you got here, you're always dealing with competition, right? How do you handle the competition when you're up against other people? What has worked for you in competing? As far as like competing offers and yeah, let's, let's say offers or even listing presentations. I mean, because you, you're, you're an outsider who came into this marketplace basically. So there's people that have been here, you know, the people have been here for, whatever, you know, yeah. I call them generals in the business that want to tell you who's this Larry girl coming in the my market. How, how did you compete? I mean, what made you win? So obviously this strategy wouldn't work when I was first starting out, but you know, what I tell a lot of people now is, Hey, look, yes, I'm here. I haven't been here my whole life, but all of these agents who are coming in and, you know, maybe have been here their whole lives. I would ask them, you know, the most important question is, is not how long have you been in the business? But how many deals have you done in the past year? How many deals have you done in the past month? How many homes have you sold? Um, and see what that answer is, because that's the more relevant question rather than how long have you been in the market? Because um, there's so many part-time agents in our industry. Now, when I was first starting out, I had a mentor where I was able to base off of my mentor's numbers as well and say, look, me and my, my partner, because that's what he told me to call him. Like, hey, look, I'm not your mentor, I'm your partner. Um, because we did partner on, on everything and, you know, we've sold X amount of homes in the last year because those were his homes that he was telling me and giving me mentorship on. Right. Uh, we were able to really lean in on that. So if you can get a mentor, get a mentor and have them help you. Yeah. So you can share the stats from the mentor that helps you build your state. Have you ever had a question like, uh, Hey, have you sold ever, do you ever sell any in my neighborhood or, you know, have you sold anything in our neighborhood? Have you ever get that kind of objection? I haven't gotten that recently, um, not in the last, I think maybe when I first, first started, but I haven't gotten it in the last, like, what's the big, what's that one objection that you're getting a little bit more on right now? If you get them. Um, I would, I think the biggest objection that I'm getting is really proving my value to, to sellers because they're like, well, oh, look, I can just put it on the market and I'm going to have five offers off of X, Y, and Z you know, website right. within 24 hours. So then what else? And so then I really have to dive into, okay, here's all the things that I do behind the scenes that you probably never see or the things that I help with that you probably wouldn't know where to go from, from here. Um, you know, a good example is a client of mine was, we were getting ready to, to list her house and a tree branch was like scraping her roof and like it started in a wind I climbed up in the tree and I helped to cut the tree branch down. So part of value that you had. <laughs> I can see, I can see a lawsuit happening here, but just be careful. Do not climb. Yeah. So, but Jordan, you, so what you're saying is you're going out of your way and helping people. Yeah. Right. Which is good. Which is good. I mean, you're not just, um, and what I, what I see in here with someone who is uh, shy, you actually have a connection with people better, faster than, a driver personality or maybe someone who's an analytical you tend to connect with people they feel that you're an honest person which uh it's you're the product so you're demonstrating you as the product and they're buying the product because they feel there's a connection um and in in your listing presentation are you a one-step person or a two-stepper on a, on a listing presentation what do you mean by that like do you go there i mean if someone says hey i'd like for you to come over and, and talk to me about listing the house are you going there to get the listing the first time or are you going in see the house and then you go back and get a, uh, then do the, the presentation later? So that'd be either one step or two step. How do you do it? So a lot of it depends on the personality of the person that I'm going to talk to. If they are more reserved and I tell them, you know, I ask them like, hey, where are you at in the process? Are you ready to list? Are you just looking at 
options. Like where, where are we at? Where's your mindset at? And I base it off of that. Um, most people that I go and talk to, they're like, Hey, look, I'm ready to list. I just need to know what I need to do. Okay, great. Let's go. Let's get the listing paperwork signed. We'll go over all the things that we need to do and we'll list it in the amount of time that you need to list it. Uh, that's what most of the people that contact me are ready for. But if they're not ready for that, then we'll do as many steps as you need to. Sometimes it's five steps. You know, I've gone to a home five different times before they're ready to list. What about price of um, changes right now with the marketplace? How are you handling these price adjustments when they don't want to do it? Do I mean, because there's a point in time that you're going to be the authority here and they're going to have to take your advice and you're getting pushback on these price adjustments. And right now, not as much because the market's kind of moving kind of you know, fairly well. But are you facing any of that right now? I haven't had to face that, um, thankfully, on a lot of my last, my most recent listings. Um, everything's just That's kind good. of going. Uh, yeah. which is great. And I think a lot of that has to do with the way that I present the numbers to sellers to start with is, look, this is our top range. This is our medium range. This is our low range. Um, you know, and just kind of going through numbers like that. If I'm at my top range and the sellers want to go above that, um, which I've had happen in the past, and, you know, I just make sure that it's, it's written in an email or on paper or whatever saying, I don't recommend going to this price. I hope we can get it because if we get this price, we both get paid more. That's great. Um, but if we can't, then we need to talk about doing this reduction in this amount of time. And then when we talk about that reduction in that amount of time, I refer back to that email and say, hey, look, remember when we talked about this? Um, so it's all about setting expectations um, in the first place. And that's the best way to handle the objection is handling it before it becomes an objection. Yeah. So, um, which is interesting because with the market moving fairly well, the only thing I'm hearing now, and you tell me if this is happening to you, that sometimes the appraisers are not coming in because you've got the prices are moving. I mean, you're seeing a average five to seven percent in most markets increase from last year, which is good. Have you had any difficulties on appraisals and, and how are you handling that situation? Or is there everything coming in because you priced Gosh. it right the first time? Gosh, Bill, don't you make me knock on wood and all yeah, these well, things. Yeah, well, this is good. <laughs> this is actually good. Because here's the answer. If it's not happening, then you are pricing it right. So it doesn't happen. Because what happens is, what if they tell you, can you list it 10 grand over what you thought it was? And you know you're going to have a problem. So what you're saying is, I'm getting them right. Yeah, right. I, I tell right. my clients straight up, like, look, I'm looking at the same numbers that appraisers look at. Um, I've gone to lots of classes taught by appraisers. I've talked to a lot of appraisers online, um, which by the way, if y'all can go to a class taught by appraiser, do it. That's where I wanted to go with you. And you <laughs> went right there is the fact that you said, listen, basically I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Appraisers are gods and I want to do the same thing that gods are doing and looking at. I want to look at the same thing that they're doing. So wait a minute. I've never heard that script before. Wait a minute, go back. Appraisers are gods. And I want to go where I want to go where the God is. Is that what it is? That what it, it does, you, that's what it is. I want to see what the gods are seeing. <laughs> Cause they're determining the price. Actually, that's not a bad script because people go, well, that's kind of funny. But then again, I understand what you're saying. If appraisal is if they're the main dudes in this deal, then we better not upset the apple cart. Exactly. Because then there's a domino effect that's gonna take place. We don't have a deal. We're back to renegotiating and you can lose this opportunity. Yep. Right. So actually, not a bad script. You guys should write that one down. And that was a good <laughs> one. I like that one. I've never heard that one before. So, OK, so let's get let's get back to your goals with your business right now. I mean, you're, you've you've got a little one here. You're you're averaging this amount. Um, do you have any team members on? Are you are you solo right now? I'm solo. Um... I'm looking at the possibility of hiring a transaction coordinator for the next year, um, just based on how my pipeline is going. Mm -hmm. um, I teach a lot of the newer agents in my office. And right now they're doing some of the more of the admin type stuff for me because it's teaching them and helping right. me. Um, so it's kind of a, a win win. Right. Um, but I am hoping to get something more consistent um, as far as a transaction coordinator for the next year. Do you like staying small or do you think maybe down the road you might want to expand and get a team? 
it's something that I, I think about frequently. <laughs> um, cause I would like to be able to spend more time with my family and have other people making my money, but I'm also very OCD and, you know, my broker yells at me about this all the time and she goes, Jordan, you need to let go of some of the control. Yeah. I like to have control. I like things to be a certain way. And I like my clients taking care of a certain way. Um, and anybody that comes to me, if I give them to another agent, I need to make sure that that agent is the same caliber. So the idea of a team kind of stresses me out. Yeah. I talk a lot about that when, especially you OCD people, it's like, I've got to have my hands on everything. And it's, it's a handoff actually uh, because you're so, I mean, people will take your advice they will take your advice when you hand it off and say, this is the transaction corner coordinator for all the you know, transactions I do. I think what we forget about is what's the benefit to the consumer for this? Mm-hmm. You know, you know I mean, you're doing it for you, but what is the benefit of this person taking on the transaction to closing and being able to articulate that to the consumer? And they go, well, you know, that makes sense, Jordan. I, I thank you for doing that. It works. You just have to let go, Jordan. You just have to let go. You know, it's, it's just finally, you know, and it's so hard. I love to let go. I mean, you know, um, when I had my company, um, I had, you know, I had every, I had all the people that needed to let go. And, it, and this is what we call finding the who, right. right? Who, who would do this for me? Who would do that? And feeling comfortable with the who, the person that you hire. I mean, can you imagine what can happen to your business if you start letting go? Okay, wait a minute. How much <laughs> much more business do you think you can do per year if you if you let go more how much more how many more units how many more deals i would say minimum 10 10 more units 10 minimum. more units watch this this is a coaching moment for a second so 10 times your average commission let's just say i don't know five or six thousand dollars right mm-hmm. so you're sixty thousand dollars away you let go that's 60 grand in your pocket minimum This is where sometimes I go, guys, think about this. It's all about (laughs) 60 grand. What can you do with $60,000? You know, um, they're just a transaction coordinator is a great piece. You know, even when you're hiring an assistant, I always tell people just to, you know, keep the transaction corner, have the assistant. I mean, that's a lot of money. I mean, that's, that's 2021 could be a big year for you. Could it? So yeah, yeah. This is so cool. So, all right. So now what, any books, anything that you read, cause you're mentoring younger agents too. What do you see is the biggest mistake these, these agents are making in the beginning of their career career? The biggest mistake that I see people making is thinking that stuff is just going to fall in their lap. Thinking that our jobs are, you know, what certain network television makes it look out to be, you know, where we just live this glamorous, bougie life and all of this stuff just happens and we make millions of dollars. It's not like Bravo. No. (laughs) Shoot. You know, where sometimes I'm like, I watch, you know, different shows. I'm like, do I need to change marketplaces? No, it's really not like that. (laughs) To be honest with you, let me just tell you, for those of you that watch those programs, uh, uh, I was working with an agent in Beverly Hills where they're doing this. They actually, and I won't mention names, they actually gave this person who wasn't that productive an office to make it look like it was, this is all staged. The guy that was there, they were following him around. So um, don't believe everything you see because it wasn't. So so let's get back to them. So what then what do you tell them? It's not Bravo anymore. You've got to have to work. What else do you yeah. tell them? Um, I think another huge thing that I see a lot of agents falling into is they're not financially prepared to go into this full time when they first start, mm-hmm. which then really makes it hard. They've got to do it part time because they still have their bills to pay. They still have their family to take care of, which then makes it the building the pipeline go even longer, which then gets them more discouraged. And then they end up quitting. Um, yeah. They fall off the cliff. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you keep them on? How do you keep them lasered in how do you keep them just stay with it do this i mean do you tell them to to quit their job i mean what what goes on there Uh, each person is so different and each situation is so different you know you kind of approach it the same way that i approach it at least the same way that i do my listing and buyers clients because every transaction is so different and every new agent is so different with what their circumstances are 
you know, when, when they're first looking at getting into real estate, that's when I like to talk to them most. That way I can be like, look, be prepared. This is what it looks like. 60 to 80 hours a week. If you can do a full-time job on top of that to pay your bills, great. If not, get, get that savings going, get that three to six months of savings going. Um, so you can hit the ground running. Good. And then, but, but do, it doesn't it level off at certain points where you're putting your, your, a lot of hours in at first, getting things cranked up. How long did it take to see this thing level off for you to uh, you know, decent amount of hours? Well, decent is depending on the, <laughs> the person, but uh, you, about six months. Yeah. All right. So you get, so guys, it's not going to be this way forever, but you do have to pay your dues. What you're saying. Yep. You do. Okay. Absolutely. So what book, and I don't say the one that I think you're going to say, but just something else. Uh, <laughs> what, what book do you recommend that would help someone to either get their head straight or get themselves focused on really growing their business? Anything that you could recommend that you've read that helped you? Um, I love anything by Lee Brown. Um, she's another realtor out of uh, the Charlotte area in, in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, she's got a great book called The Seven Deadly Sins of Sales. and it's a fantastic, easy read. Um, her podcast is hilarious as well. Um, Cause sometimes, you know, it's very easy to start taking ourselves too seriously. Um, and she kind of, she helps you take a step back and really appreciate the business. From what did you learn from her that helped you? Really just to go out, go out there, go do it. Um, you know, one of her biggest pieces of, of advice is make one call a day. How many contacts do you have in your phone? not just people that you know, even people who are brand new to the area, how many contacts you have in your phone that you can call and just talk to them because this is a people business. Get involved with people, talk to your sphere, talk to people every day, whether it's about real estate or not, just make one phone call a day. And if you make that one phone call, you're likely to make another and another and another. And I would say if you get the guts to call Fizzbells and expired, because you just said, hey, this whole Fizzbell game I, and I agree with it. This could be huge in 2021. So if you're shy about making those calls and you're actually making those calls, like between now and the end of the year, by the time January comes, you keep, now you're ready to call those Fizbos. Um, you can quit your job and then you can get into this, this business full time. This is great. So Jordan, thanks for being on. This is great. And uh, you, the, you're doing great. And your little one's going to be selling real estate with you soon. It's going to be your partner in crime, which is going to be really cool. Thanks so much for being on, everybody. Hey, that was a good advice. Lee Brown, what was the name of the book again? Seven Deadly Sins of Sales. Of Sales. Good. We'll get that. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.